student in uh, mechanical engineering. And my conclusion over the one, two, three, four, five years in, in uh, uh, Yiminji and uh, two years as a master student, so seven years study of mechanical engineering. I have a conclusion, there are two things. I only, I only learned two things. Uh, the Newton's law, and you probably learned that in your, your middle school. And uh, the second thing I learned was thermodynamics. That's it. Every class I take is either Newton's law or thermodynamics, one variation to another. And actually, artificial intelligence here, uh, we, we evolved today all orange, somewhere sometime around 1960s or 1950s. And they start with two branch of artificial intelligence. Right? And, uh, and it's actually coming uh, from here. And back then, um, Herbert Simon was proponent of something what we call the uh, decision tree artificial intelligence, or so-called deterministic artificial intelligence. Right? So what does that mean by this deterministic? It's uh, where the expert system is coming from, right? And you, have, you, you, you usually have that experience of uh, similar technology in your life as well. And to me, uh, say for example, if you want to, I mean, I, I like to drink wine, right? So, so I, I sample a lot of wine. And uh, so if you, if you are, uh, and that we have wine tasting class here, right? So in the summer, have you guys taken the wine tasting class in the summer here? Yes? Yeah, so uh, if you don't know what wine you want to taste, what, what do you do? The person try to sell you the wine will ask you a lot of questions. Do you like uh, sweet or dry? Do you like uh, more uh, tennis or less tennis? Do you like the acid or not acid? And you, you ask a lot of questions. Based on those questions, they would derive a category of the wine or grape that you feel like you want. That's called the deterministic artificial intelligence. So it assumes that everything you can come up with the rule of, uh, rules of if something happened, then something. So if you like sweet, you go that one. If you like dry, you go the other way. Right? So if then else is the deterministic rule, right? The other category of artificial intelligence called the prob probabilistic world. So it's basically on, uh, based on the probabilist uh, probability of the thing may happening using big number, big data to come up with estimate, right? So one is probabilistic, the other is deterministic, right? So uh, earlier artificial intelligence, because they are applied, on, uh, most, most of them are applied in the structure problem solving, it's more deterministic. But nowadays, it's go the other way around. Most of the artificial intelligence we are looking at today is probabilistic. It goes that direction, right? Now, the, uh, so, the sec so that's the first contribution, classification. The second contribution is called the process, right, process. And this uh, is, uh, to me, uh, I, I, uh, the more I read, the more feeling I have about this. Uh, look very simple, but actually uh, come up with the variation of a thing that is endless, right? In, um, in philosophy, in philosophy, there are two categories of philosophy. Uh, two categories of philosophy. One category is called uh, ontology, ontology, ontological concept. Ontology, ontology means that uh, it asks the, the question, what is it? What am I? Who am I? What is the world? What is this uh, table? So it's, it's about the essence of uh, the, the things that we are experiencing and looking at, right? So, so that is one, and that, that question of ontology is best answered by category or classification. So if you can come up with some kind of classification, and actually in business school, we do a lot of this. And um, in Harvard Business School, they, there's a joke says, uh, every professor will become a professor in Harvard. You need to come up with a two by two. Have you heard about that? No, you haven't heard about that? You need to have a two by two, right? Uh, when you have a famous two by two, you get a professorship at Harvard, right? For example, one, one of the ha Harvard professors I uh, admire, I don't know, maybe, yeah, admire, is called uh, uh, Michael Porter. Everybody know Michael Porter? Theory of uh, competitive advantage, framework of competitive advantage. The uh, framework is two by two. How do you get competitive advantage in the business? It's either 
low cost or specialization. It's either cheap or something special. Cheap, if you are somewhere in between, it's a mix, hybrid. So it's, it's two, it's only two, two by two. It's called two by two theory. So you actually uh, see a lot of this uh, uh, theory in service management as well, but you know, we're not going to that, that um, but two by two. So with this, you can come up with a two by two, right? Later, later we'll see this two by two category. So a problem, if when you have two different type of problem, one is structure, the other is on structure, you can come up with a uh, division between uh, two extremes and we can, so ontology uh, question, you can answer by classification. So we come up with a good classification, right? Uh, then you can come up with a good uh, way of uh, uh, decision. Say for example, in marketing, we usually come up with something what we call the customer segmentation. It's one of the things that art, artificial intelligence, machine learning do the best. Try to classify customer into segment, right? So traditionally in the, in the US, uh, US market, you probably see that the marketer will, will classify, you are generation X, you are generation uh, millennia, and different generation, you have different buying behavior. Right? And how do you come up with this generation? It's in the past, it's based on the time you were born and some events. But in nowadays, when we have an uh, uh, environment like Facebook or Instagram, they, cl they classify you not based on your, your uh, demographic background. They, based on, they uh, classify you based on where you visit, what time you visit, how long you stay on there, what kind of content you are viewing. So based on those information, they classify you into some, something that maybe human being cannot understand, but that classification is important. So, uh, so when we face a problem, right, so the, the lesson learned is, the first thing you need to uh, know is try to classify, and classi classification becomes a foundation, something what we call analysis. So when, we try, when you try to do analysis, right, so Zhongwen, so when you try to analyzing something, you start analyzing something, what do you mean by analyzing something? You, have you ever thought about this? What does that mean by anal uh, uh, analytics? What, what, what does that mean by analyzing things? Say if you are, you are analyzing your professor, professor. So how do you analyze me? How, how do I analyze you? If you are a, uh, well, I don't know, a doctor, uh, you know, shrink, yeah, people call the psychology doctor shrink, right? So how do you analyze a person? You try to classify the person. And when you create classification, you get into detail, right? So uh, for example, you classify me as male versus female. Classify me as uh, people born in the 60s versus uh, 2000, right? And you classify me as a uh, tall, medium, short person, right? You classify me by my income level. So all these classification sort of uh, make you understand more about me. When you understand more about me, you can come up with uh, what? Better strategy of dealing with me. Because we have some sort of a uh, tested knowledge or, or something you don't say much. But it seems like, okay, we uh, look at young people, what should we do you know, with the young people? We want to uh, make something attractive to young people. You look at the older people, uh, you know, do something. And you make assumption based on the classification. Then you can make decision and solve the problem, right? or in, in the business world, we solve the problem by design product or service selling to the customer, right? So that is one important contribution. The second category of philosophy uh, is called um, epistemology. Epistemology uh, is kind of a big word. Uh, don't worry about that, you know, philosophy word. It's talking about the process. And the question asked in the second category of a philosophy is uh, how do I get there? How do I do certain thing? The question of how versus the question of what. What is the question of uh, classification? How is the question of process? So if you want to, you, you have an idea you want to achieve, you want to start with, a, you want to start a coffee shop. Now you need to have a process. Right, so you, you already know, okay, I want to call, and, but by the way, uh, that's using this as an example. Uh, you want to start a coffee shop. The first thing you need to do is classify your coffee shop. Come up with a category. What kind of coffee shop you want to run? 
you run the run a, a, a human oriented or robot oriented, for example. You want to run a big one or a small one. You want to run an expensive one or a cheap uh, coffee shop. Right. Or you want to run a motorcycle coffee shop. That's another story. I think. I think that I, I saw a news somewhere in Taiwan that somebody is riding a motorcycle with a coffee and they can sell uh, poor pour over coffee on, on the road. But anyway, classification. The second thing is once you have classified your group of customer or product, the second thing is what? How do you come up with a, a process, a plan, a plan to get there? So the second question is called epistemology question. How do you get there? What is the process? So uh, Herbert Simon answered this question by come up with this. Uh, doesn't seem to be very interesting, but extremely important uh, process called the problem solving process. Right. Among the problem solving process, I believe half of them are called the uh, uh, decision making process. So decision making is actually, according to Herbert Simon, is a, a, middle, a step in the problem solving. So you have to make a decision. And decision is right here. Select a plan, solution. So you make a decision of something. But you have to analyze the problem. And everything that uh, goes through the proce process surrounding by data. So at the beginning, you have to collect data uh, to identify and define the problem. And uh, going through the uh, process of analyzing the problem, you, have, you come into data to classify the problem into category, and then so on and so forth. So data is in the center. right? So that is called the problem uh, solving process. That is the category of a uh, uh, problem. Right? With these two in mind, then you, you are better equipped to analyze artificial intelligence. How can artificial intelligence solve business problem? How can you apply artificial intelligence? So wh where does the artificial intelligence play a role in the process? Of course, again, data in the middle. So you, you started to get a sense of uh, what exactly artificial intelligence can do for you. right? So uh, here are some historical lessons, right? Uh, come on, coming from uh, probably your other classes. And uh, this guy is called Edward Deming. Uh, he is uh, one of the guru in the quality movement. And the short history of this person, he was a, um, he had a PhD, uh, I think coming out of Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, he worked for General Motors at first. And later, uh, he, was, he lost his job from General Motors. And uh, uh, what, guess what he did in General Motors? Quality control. So his specialty is statistic quality control. So uh, what, uh, when he was not, uh, forgot he was not promoted, or, or anyway, he feel bad in the United States. So he went to Japan and help create the empire called the Toyota uh, by helping them improve the quality of Japanese car. So that was in the 1980s, and this movement is called the Total Quality Management Movement. Right? And he proposed a cycle called Deming Cycle. Without explaining too much, uh, you should uh, go into the um, industrial engineering department here, not industrial engineering, to ask some of the professors or some of the course you're taking from them. Uh, so if you look at this uh, do, check, act, and plan, and plan, right, act and plan, with, it's actually a simplified version of this. Simplified. You have a plan in the here. You have to uh, make a decision and do here. This is a do cycle. And that do, check, and plan, and going back one more time, uh, is the, it is a uh, variation of uh, problem solving process. So this is a process uh, uh, methodology. And I uh, randomly search on the internet and come up with this picture from a consulting company called Tech Edge Group. They are proud of their artificial intelligence and uh, big data process. So this is a big data process. Look at their process, so frame the problem, collect data, process data, explore data, perform analysis, getting the result, and go over the cycle again. Right? Different but similar. So it's, it's actually, again, a problem solving. So this is why um, guru is important. Once you see that, you know that everybody doing it is just following, copy, 
their process in one way or the other, right? So, and when I was a student, I said, well, so what? Uh, you know the process, but you still don't know how to get there. But once you be able to, to think a little bit deeper, say you want to uh, open up the sh coffee shop, now you start to think about, uh, you know, you want to analyze your situation. So how, how do I uh, come up with this uh, solution of our, our problem, or solve the problem of uh, me uh, open up a coffee shop in five years, right? So what you need to do, you roll back, you have to plan, you, you have to draw a gain chart or gun chart that uh, draw a tree uh, map or something leads to you. Then you start to think about, you know, uh, the requirement, right? Requirement. Uh, I need money. Do you need money to start a coffee shop? Do you need to know coffee? You need to be a good expert to, to, be a, to run a coffee shop, right? Well, maybe not. I don't know. Maybe just use artificial intelligence to do that. Well, you need knowledge, coffee knowledge. You need money. Uh, you need to search for a location or maybe a way to design this, right? So uh, then you have to think back five or three, if you say three years or five, say I use five years, right? five years. Then you look back and say, okay, how long does, does it make to, uh, to make myself a coffee expert? You have not, not, you're not just only go to 7-Eleven to buy coffee anymore. Now you, have, you want to be a coffee expert. So you have to plan to taste every coffee and make yourself an expert, right? So how do you make that? Right? And you start, well, how many different coffee or how long will you learn the, the skill of uh, differentiate different coffee? Right? Do I need to take a lesson? Right? Uh, maybe you need to, say, uh, spend $5,000 go to a school. So where is the school? And once you start thinking about this problem, so uh, in five years, when should I be doing that? Uh, then in, after five years, I can have this knowledge. Then now you can play. And that is where the process come in, right? And we are in the process of uh, analyzing the problem earlier in the stage, but, uh, th but that give you some clue of going forward. And that is actually the ability now, because a lot of time you, uh, you find in our real life is that when you face a situation, you just don't know where to start and what to do. You know, you know, that, and if you don't count down and start analyzing category things into different uh, groups and start thinking about the timeline, how do you plan the process? So category and process will help you to get the grip of every problem you try to solve. Right, so uh, and when you apply artificial intelligence, how can artificial intelligence help you in terms of what? Create category, how help you in terms of spe speeding up the process? So that is actually the clue to the answer of uh, what you need to know. And that, that is actually not the direct answer, but um, um, category and process, right? category and process, that uh, repeat that word a little bit more. And uh, I'll, I'll jump a slide and go into this one. More example of management theory, and I hope some of you will, will encounter some of the theory um, in certain point in time in your, your textbook reading or some other thing. That, this is why I, I was telling a joke about our president, because th these are all the books I read before and uh, you know, learned some, something that I feel profoundly. So if you want me to recommend some book you, you can read and learn, these are some of the good books, right? So there are two books here. One is called The Go. This is a, a very good, a very old, uh, very old book uh, from coming out of a production operation management field. And this particular book the, uh, is talking about process. How do you uh, come up with the process and, uh, and come up with good? And this actually leads to a very important clue about what is the next generation of artificial intelligent, right? Um, and later we will talk about, now I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the, uh, the, the uh, problem here about artificial intelligence. The current artificial intelligence, we call it artificial intelligence, but usually people will consider it just a, a more sophisticated automation, right? So, so when, we, when you say we look at um, uh, uh, facial recognition, it's not really intelligent, right? It's just a very fast processing. It can recognize your face. When you're talking about the Facebook, uh, uh, try to sell you something that uh, uh, 
making the best guess of your preference. That is not true intelligence, that's just statistic. Right? So all these that you, you think and that, that will lead you to think, well, the current artificial intelligence, even say, for example, uh, AlphaGo beating the Go player, it's very narrow. You know, what can AlphaGo do other than play, playing the Go game? Can AlphaGo do something else that, that is, say, uh, better than me, right? better than you and me as a human being? So that is the ultimate question we try to break. Right? But basically, the, the current observation of artificial intelligence is artificial intelligence are very narrow. So you design a program called machine learning. It learns something in a domain very narrow. Y this program can learn only uh, how to classify a uh, customer, but it will not recommend you strategy. Right? So, so in artificial intelligence world, is how do I train? Because I have enough processing power and data. How do I train this to go next step? The next step is th this program need to search for problem itself, by itself. So one, one of the difference, uh, this is the, uh, uh, pretty much the uh, observation, observation and conclusion of our lecture today is, one of the main difference between the so-called artificial intelligence and you, and you and me, right? Because that leads to the uh, ultimate uh, topic of our class here today is, you, you, want, you want to make sure that artificial intelligence cannot replace you in, on the job market, right? So you want to find a job, but you don't want the artificial AI replace you. So how do you put this up? You want to do something AI cannot do, right? So one other thing artificial intelligence cannot do yet today is called search for a problem. The current AI is you have to give the AI a problem. Now end up say, okay, go play the game. Then that, that is the goal. You have to provide a goal to the artificial intelligence. If the artificial intelligence do not have a goal, the machine, the program does not have a desire. Now, human being has a desire to do certain things. So we have a goal to achieve, right? But the artificial intelligence, they do not have that, that goal-seeking uh, ability. This book gives you a clue about where the next generation of artificial intelligence is to, to automatically seeking goal for you. But you know, it's still very narrow. And, and let me just quickly explain what this book is all about, right? Uh, one book in uh, three minutes. Uh, the, the, the basic founda foundation of this book is called, the, uh, the title is called The Theory of Constraint, right? So basically, uh, the, the book is talking about when you try to look at the problem, the first thing you need to do is try to map the problem in a uh, process. And this is a network of process, right? So every production process is a network. So it's coming from the idea of assembly line. So in order to run an assembly line, you have to have uh, different parts. Every part has uh, a vendor providing this part at a different time. And this, this, uh, this part is coming in. And sometimes during the process, the, the parts will run out. And sometimes uh, that, uh, uh, and on the assembly line, you will have labor to work on the line, right? Person uh, monitoring the station and moving stuff around. And so that, that assembly line is a system. Then you study the uh, assembly line by drawing a process map of that particular assembly line. And uh, the most important thing about management, right, we are in the management field, is to identify where the problem of this line. Right, where is the problem of this line? Is the, the problem of this line uh, due to the machine that you are using, not good enough, bad machine. So you always create a problem. Or you have lazy worker in the process that will slow you down, right? Or you have bad parts, bad vendor, or the design of the product itself is a problem. So there is a problem in this, uh, it could be early in the process, could be late in the process. So once you understand the process, the first thing is identify the weakest point. So where the problem is, is where the, uh, and in the theory of constraint, it's called bottleneck. So you have a bottleneck. Bottleneck is where that constraint. It could be people, it could be machine, it could be money. You know, when you run a big business, suddenly that everybody buying your product. You don't have uh, money to buy a new machine, hire people. It could be. So once you identify that weak, weakest link, you strengthen the weakest link. Say, for example, if you are running a, a coffee shop, uh, you, uh, your coffee shop becomes so successful, now you want to have a, a second shop, third shop. 
How do you run second shot and third shot? How do you duplicate? You need money. So now your your constraints money. The once you buy the money, uh, once you borrow the money from the bank or from somebody or from your reinvestment of your profit, the problem will move to another place. The problem will be, well, the new store, the the employee is not well trained, so you have to train the employee. So once the um, one once the constraint is uh, solved or the bottleneck solved, the bottleneck moves to another place in the product. So you continuously analyze the system. You always find the problem in different places in your system. And when you improve one place, the problem moves to another. So, so the whole job of uh, managing a company, managing a factory, managing a business is always look for problems, solve the problem, and look for another problem. There are always problems somewhere else. And the more problem you solve, the system becomes better and more efficient and better. Right, so that is the basic idea of theory of constraint. And this is more like a storybook. They are talking about uh, trying to describe how do you run a factory uh, using a story. Um, a person hired into the company, talking to his, his manager, doing the, all the job here. Right, so that is a, so how do I, how do you use artificial intelligence? Because the algorithm is there already. How do you use artificial intelligence in the next generation? If you can come up with a way of using artificial intelligence by asking the artificial intelligence to jump from one problem to another, you set up some sort of a game so the, pr the artificial intelligence will know to search for problem. That takes you to the next generation of artificial intelligence. Still not as good as a human being, but uh, uh, with some uh, way of doing that. So this is epistemology, a process of going to uh, apply artificial intelligence. This one uh, go the other way around. And this one uh, on the right is usually called the methodology of continuous improvement. So you keep going, uh, solving one problem at a time and uh, continuous improve. Traditional quality movement. On the uh, left hand side is another book in the 1990s talking about dramatic change, dramatic change. So a lot of time it's not about, uh, uh, because the pro sometimes when the system has big change, say uh, in, uh, in, in uh, China, when everything moved from paper currency to WeChat Pay or Alipay, it's a big change. When the big change come, there are too many problems in the system. You cannot have, uh, you cannot improve the current system anymore. The solution is, you design a new system to, a to use a new technology. Right? So when you face a situation that you cannot do continuous improvement, you have to redesign. This is called a redesign concept. So one is continuous improvement, the other is redesign. And this redesign is still hard to be, uh, uh, at least in the current artificial intelligence age, hard for machine to learn. So the redesign needs to be done by human beings. So uh, why the uh, key words of innovation and creativity become so important because that is the part machine cannot do and th that is redesign. So one is redesign, the other is continuous. So the next generation of artificial intelligence will be here. And uh, the very next is called the ultimate point is when the machine can define its own objective by itself, right? but now not yet. So that uh, is uh, uh, some, probably uh, the most, uh, how, how do I describe, that's my two cents. After learning management theory for 20 years, come up with that conclusion. There are two ways of uh, uh, always improving your job, your work, your company. So everything we treat as a problem and how do you solve a problem? You classify the problem into two parts. Some problem you can continuously improve. Some problem you have to redesign. And once you decide on which way to go, you go into that methodology or that process to identify bottleneck or you come up with, uh, you search for inspiration on the other way around. So that is the, the process. So now uh, we have uh, studied the fundamental. Let's uh, go into this uh, category of uh, artificial intelligence thing can or cannot do question, Because right. I'm, is that, that clock correct time? Yes. Okay, so. 
15 more minutes. Yeah, 15 more minutes. So using 50 minutes, I'll give you some, uh, because we spend a lot of time kind of knowing to it. This is actually, you know, uh, usually I use uh, three hours in, in the lecture here for, for this lecture. But um, so these are probably the thing that you will see as um, uh, human versus uh, machine. What human can do better versus machine. Yeah, because you want, yes. Luke, you have a question? Oh, I thought you raised your hand. So your last name is not Skywalker. You are a Skywalker? Uh, it's a, it's a uh, 80s generation joke. That's, uh, because Luke Skywalker is the master, the, Yoda, the, the Jedi master of Star Wars world. So you're... So that's, that's the, why the name was uh, chosen? Okay, so you're a Star Wars fan. Very good. May the force with you. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so these are the jobs that we think that the machine can, cannot do better than human being. Machine cannot make better judgment. Machine cannot have creativity. Machine cannot handle human feeling, interaction. I, I know when you look at the category, you, you probably try to find an example of that machine can make judgment. The earlier problem is a classification. You try to classify uh, people into customer group. Machine can do better already, right? Uh, creativity can can machine be more creative, right? So that that's a, that's a question. Machine can do it better. Can I? Human can do better. You think so? Okay. Yeah. I mean that's common sense, right? I mean usually we think that way. Right now, there's some example I'll show you that, it, no, it's actually a machine can be creative. Because creative, if you are limited to that creativity in a, in a single, very narrow domain, machine can learn, uh, actually do better than most people. Not all, but better than most people, okay? Machine can do better judgment, machine can do better creativity, that's just that thing. Machine can handle, well, exception? Exception means that something that the uh, wrong as planned, but go out of, uh, say for example, if you are running a uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, system running the uh, power plant, say burning coal or burning or running the hydraulic plant, uh, generating power, power, right? nuclear power, whatever. Power, running a power plant using, using AI, collecting data, trying to monitor everything. What happens if earthquake hit? Can machine handle that earthquake? that create uh, uh, some unexpected situation in your factory. You know, water coming, mountains fa falling down, that sort of thing. So that's called exception handling. Right? Can ha machine do better than human or human? Obvious answer is look like human do better, right? Or prediction, uh, look like prediction is actually doing. So the next few slides I wanna show, uh, share with you, uh, I'll go through the example very quickly, telling you that machine can pretty much do all these. Um, but some of them machine do better. Some of them machine are not as good. Judgment machine is that uh, there? There are selective method and so on and so forth. This is another book I, I don't want to share with you, but I will, I will jump, jump, jump to another thing. Right. Uh, so the first example is machine making judgment, and this is a a, a case study in from two, uh, 2014 study the legal system in, in, in Israel, right? And the uh, situation is that the, I think the, the judge have to grant uh, parole to inmate. So they're prisoner, right? And, and you know, prisoner can get parole if you have good behavior, right? So who should I give in parole to? Um, do I need to, parole, is it understandable? Everybody understand what parole means. Um, in Chinese, I would say that in Chinese also, at least some of the Chinese uh, students can understand. 就是假释,你要给犯人假释。假释是什么? So the parole decision by the Israel judge 
And uh, they discover that uh, it's not fair. It is not fair. And uh, the pattern shows that uh, whenever the parole officer or the judge taking a break, say lunch break, after he, well, say this is the, uh, this is the timeline, I think, timeline. And e every time when he comes back from a break, he becomes more rigorous. And when the day goes, I become tired and he become more relaxed and let more people go. So whether you will be, if you're a prisoner, whether you will be getting a parole depends on what time you go into the courtroom, not which judge you face. Right, so that is, so, uh, and so based on this, actually a lot of the program has been written to make a recommendation about parole in both the United States and Israel. And they found another problem. There is a, a racial discrimination problem in the parole. But anyway, so this is artificial intelligence uh, is trying to do and they identify the problem. This is actually another thing that, um, example, without going too much detail. I put this slide here because this is actually where my, my son, that one, that guy over there, grew up, and, uh, and he grew up in this particular county. And the number here shows that uh, how do you, how, how does the uh, panel of higher, the, uh, the education in that particular county decide that you are a gifted student, smart student? Because your gifted student will be sent into a, a special class to be trained better, right? So all the Asian parents want, want our kids to be a gifted uh, student. Uh, to find a way to train your students so that they can uh, score better and become gifted. And there is a data showing that um, um, racial discrimination as well. If you're in different race, you have less disadvantage to get into the, uh, uh, get into the, the uh, gifted program. The, the main problem is you look at the number from, for the Hispanic, between 2004 and 2005, it's 16%. Hispanic getting to the gifted program. 2006 to 2007, the year after, Hispanic grew up almost double in, in number, in percentage, not number, in percentage, right? Uh, the main difference between these two years, between 2005 and 2006, was that in 2006, artificial intelligence was introduced to select the student. Before 2006, human being select the candidate. So human being will form a panel, reading the document, and interview the student, and decide, uh, you decide to see if you are gifted or not. But 2006, artificial intelligence is blind review process. So the machine will review based on the profile provided by the teachers, and machine make uh, initial recommendation. The single difference showed that, and because in South Florida, the majority of the populations are Hispanic, right? So uh, obviously they are not uh, as dumb as you think. They are equally intelligent. It's just because the system, the human system, discriminate the uh, human be uh, discriminate the student of uh, a minority in the United States, right? But after artificial in intelligence introduced, that racial uh, discrimination was corrected, more or less. So actually, machine is actually making better judgment than uh, people already, right? So th in terms of the judgment, one of the biggest category of the machine learning is try to try to solve the problem. Try to solve is to recommend a better decision, and in that particular category, the biggest problem is this: big data is try to convince people not to trust their own judgment. You have to trust the machine judgment. Right? This is actually a very important opportunity for human being to, to um, uh, but it is actually a human problem. And, and um, let me try to frame this using one example. Right? And I know that nowadays when you drive a car, you rely a lot on GPS, you use your phone. Right, but have you, especially in Taiwan, and I, I mean, it's th at least that's my personal experience. The road system in Taiwan is more narrow than complicated. 
and you cannot trust 100% of that GPS, right? So when, it, it, when you are driving, I mean, riding a motorcycle is less, less a problem. Driving in Taiwan is very dangerous, especially when you are using GPS. Why? Because the GPS will recommend you do something, and your human instinct will tell you it's not right. And so uh, when you face a, a junction of the road, you want to turn left or right, or you want to switch lane, you suddenly face this dilemma. Should I trust the machine? Or should I trust myself? Okay. So based on the uh, so-called AI expert, you should trust the machine more. <laughs> but we trust ourselves more, right? Most yeah, most people trust our own instinct, and this is actually this is actually something that uh, actually was uh, I was thinking about how do I start my talk today, and and one of the things I tried to uh, try to say here is that, um, uh, you know, w one of the difficult things that what there was like, like a joke talking about is to put your thought in other people's idea, I mean, brain, right? So being a professor, the most important privilege is I can keep, you tel keep telling you things. Uh, so that, that is my, our, our career privilege. Uh, but how much you can observe, I, I don't know. How, how much you can, um, but uh, once I can convince you, then uh, I, think, I think the joke is saying something about this. If you can convince one person and you are a, uh, I forgot uh, the analogy. Does anybody remember that joke? If you can convince one person, then you, uh, you if you can convince uh, a group of person, become a good manager. If you can convince half of the country, you become a president. And I forgot, but. Uh, anyway, so so the the idea is to convince people, right? So the opportunity, right, going back to this, is that so there is a dilemma when your customer, human being, that is that this is a problem. It is a problem of trusting AI or trusting human, and we as a person, business person, looking at this opportunity, how do we solve that problem? If you can solve that problem, that is a big business. So either how do you train people to trust machine? or make machine smarter so that people can uh, trust the machine more, or somehow force the uh, people not be able to make their own instinct or use their own instinct to make decision. Right? Some of the things already are being implemented in this automatic driving car, right? Uh, and this is very uh, frustrating, I don't know. I mean, the car that I bought to my wife uh, last year create a lot of problem to me. Because uh, uh, one of the new feature this uh, new car has is called uh, 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 lane switching or lane control. Automa it's actually semi-automatic driving. So it's preventing me of uh, driving and uh, uh, falling to asleep. Then the car will not fall. So whenever the car move away from the center of the road, the car will automatically adjust the car for, for, for me to go back. And that become a biggest that become a big problem because sometimes you just don't want to follow that road, but this car uh, forces you back so hard that you almost feel like you, you are fighting with the car, right? So that is a artificial created business problem. So if you can find a way or find a, uh, that that is an opportunity. That is where the business opportunity or job opportunity is. So, uh, so uh, how 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 that new system look like? I don't know, but that is that is actually the clue to uh, the, in the boundary of artificial intelligence and the human. How do we kind of uh, glue them together? That is uh, where the recommendation of uh, uh, Andrew McPhee. Andrew McPhee is actually a professor from uh, MIT and talking about artificial intelligence. And this is uh, leads to this. Uh, usually, I, I use this as a point for a break. I say it's okay that uh, high, this is what happened in human society. In individual decision, we trust our human instinct. In organization decision, we say, okay, you have to trust the uh, big data. You have to trust the uh, uh, an analytic. You have to trust machine learning, artificial intelligence. But uh, at the end of the day, who is making the decision? Your boss. Your boss says, no, I'm not going this way. Then that's it. 
Right? You do all these analysis. It's called a hippo problem. Yeah? Highest paid person's opinion uh, problem yeah, in the world. Right? So with, with the time constraint, uh, I'd like to uh, sk uh, skip, maybe leave this to it in the future webinar. We can do this remotely. Right? Uh, remotely is uh, in the the um, the rest of the talk probably will take another hour or two, maybe two, using the method we are doing here. Is uh, I will recommend a book, and I'll jump to the conclusion, right, to uh, stop the talk today. And by the way, this is the uh, this is the AI created painting. It's a portrait painting. It sells for four hundred thirty two thousand dollars. Same price as Picasso's painting, machine generated. That was uh, 2018, 2018, right? And if you look at that name, that's an Asian name. You know that, uh, uh, some of the thing. And this is a two by two I was uh, talking to you about that, uh, very important. So where do you identify the opportunity for, uh, for your future career in five years, not 10 years, five years? Right? Look at uh, what kind of problem are so-called unstructured or uh, or structured, and the more you move to the to the upper right corner, the safer you are. The safer you are, right? and uh, the two two dimension to classify the system is that and we already reviewed one. It's called the uh, ability to find goal objective. So artificial intelligence cannot find. What kind of problem they, you want to ask them to? You, you have to decide it on. Human have to make a decision. Uh, this, this program is going to learn how to classify customer. This program is, is going to be learning how to uh, set pricing. And th the other program had to be learn how to control the traffic. So you have to set the problem. So setting problem and, and select ap application, uncertainty of the goal is one opportunity. The other one is uh, the level of knowledge you can ask machine to learn. Right? Learn how to teach as a professor is more difficult than learn how to teach uh, elementary school mathematics. You want to teach uh, elementary school math, it's much easier because there is a structure that you can teach. But you want to teach a management class like what we have here, it's more unstructured. So level of knowledge go that, that way. So uh, you go into your job opportunity, you find, want to find that un uncertainty to become your uh, uh, capability. You don't want to be, some, uh, be classified into something that can be automated, uh, so that is uh, cool. So this is coming from Herbert Simon's category telling you. And uh, the conclusion is that it's coming from this person. Uh, he is also a, uh, he's a Taiwanese American. Uh, he was born in Taiwan actually. Um, and he was um, CEO of uh, Google China back in the early 2000, uh, Li Kaifu, right, Kaifu. So, um, and he is considered uh, the top 10 AI guru in the world, uh, at least so far. Uh, graduate PhD from Carnegie Mellon University. This is what his recommendation is, right? I'll go directly into here. He classified your skill set into two categories. Right? One category is Go from strategy, bigger problem, or creativity, right? The more go toward that side, and then you have more human. And the other uh, dimension, the other category is, do you need compassion? Do you need human touch? You need this uh, telling a joke and in, a bit in, in between, and stop the lecture when, the, when somebody come visit me, you know, and apologize, and that, that's doing this type of uh, human thing, right? So the more uh, require, require human, that you have more role. And in these four different quadrants, he also recommended what you need to be doing, what kind of job human can do. In this uh, totally structured or no compassion needed, very organized uh, problem or you, you try to work, it's all AI. Everything will be done by AI. Right? Say for example, uh, an accountant. Accountant is this category. But actually, no, if you're uh, doing auditing, that that's, has some human connection in there. Yeah, but if you're just doing text, it's all, all AI, right? 
Uh, if you are on, on this uh, particular uh, quadrant here, is you are using AI, but uh, there is a human touch surrounded by it. Right? So running a coffee shop again, you will probably have uh, all the AI and decided on what to recommend to your customer and making all the coffee. But when you try to serve the coffee, so the human becomes the, the last miles or last kilogram, a kilometer uh, to reach the customer. So when you're in the last connection to the customer, that's human. But all everything behind the human is AI. So that's this category, right? So a lot of service industry will be in this category, right? So uh, in the future, you go to a barber shop, cutting hair, wash, wash your hair. It will be a robot washing your hair, but there will be a human on the side telling a joke and do small talk. That's, that's what this is all about. Right? So that's this, this category. And you have another category, human and AI work together, right? So currently, say for example, earlier I used the example of financial market. So the AI algorithm will learn and try to come up with some kind of prediction, uh, 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 prediction model and to help you make decision on what, what uh, investment you, sh you should be doing. But uh, you use all these AI too. Uh, then, then you use additional information that you collect from say a uh, political situation that machine cannot learn. Then you add your knowledge in there and make a comparable or actually collaborative decision. So work with your program and come up with a decision will be a good idea. Right? As a professor, uh, we need to use more, uh, more Google, for example. Right? And over the time, I tried to do something that is, uh, instead of me uh, creating a slide, I would just ask the student to Google and, and try to find answer for me. On the, so there, there is a machine down there doing the, the uh, encyclopedia dictionary for me. And when you search the result, and I can comment on your result. Right, so I work with uh, Google to teach you. That's, and a lot of this picture, we, I, get, I, I create a slide are coming from Google as well. Right, so I, I work with artificial intelligence already and, and, and come up with uh, the lecture. That's this category. And finally, you have this uh, very high level and strategy level and very uh, require a lot of human emotion involved and uh, that say, for example, decided on uh, uh, where the, uh, where the, what, what is the direction of your country need to go? Now it's, it's, it's a very complicated problem, require a lot of strategy thinking. And also in the polit political environment, you also have, need to have a lot of human skill to convince people, not convince the machine. So that category is pure human. So politician is still pure human. It will not be replaced by AI for sure. Right? So uh, just give you some reference of uh, the category uh, where what Dr. Kaifu, and this book was written in 2018 uh, when he, was, uh, he, got, he got a cancer uh, back in 2016 and uh, recovered in Taiwan and wrote a book uh, in 2018. And these are the recommendation or a career path that he recommend to you uh, to see where you should put yourself in there. So repetition job will be replaced in five years. So if you consider the book was published in 2018, he's talking about 2023. Job like uh, customer support, dishwasher, Telesale will be reduced a lot, right? In 10 years, routine job will be driver, uh, drive, driverless car. Uh, the uh, security guard will be, you know, we already see this, uh, you know, in the past that a lot of this uh, parking garage has a human to attend to. Now with the uh, machine vision, there's no need for human to guard the parking garage. And uh, 15 years, you have uh, something called, uh, job to optimize uh, the, the work, including radiologist, reporter, uh, research, so reporter in 10 years. So you want to become a reporter, that's the best selection, the best choice, right? Because you can probably work for 10 years and, and that's it. And these are the jobs will probably be saved in, in 20 years time. Uh, CEO, well, not every new graduate can become a CEO, but in 10 years maybe. Uh, some sort of, uh, uh, I forgot what M and A Asper. Marketing and uh, analytic expert, maybe. Economists, some people make strategic decision. Scientists, artists, 
right, still uh, in that category to be can. Yeah, the machine can can generate those uh, art, those fake art art form, but still, you know, uh, human are more superior. So those are the recommendations by uh, the true AI expert, and uh, I recommend about five book in the slide for you. So if you can find the slide, uh, if, if you really uh, want to spend some time during the winter break, uh, that that will be the book I recommend. And let me stop here. And about not too much, right? <laughs> not go over time. Your your class you end at twelve, so we we uh, kind of end five minutes early. Any last question you want to ask before we conclude? Uh, and um, the, maybe I'll come back to campus again uh, during the time I stay this time in Taiwan to get to more know about you. And uh, don't need to be that formal. We can go just go to the classroom and talk and. Uh, and uh, didn't, one thing I didn't say uh, at the beginning is the uh, main reason I want to come back here is just to to uh, know you because uh, you are the younger me 30 years ago, 30 years ago, right, 30 years ago. So I want to see the younger you, I mean, the, the, now that you've become the future me, that's um, a lot of my inspiration to, to go to academic and to uh, are coming from the alumni that uh, go before me. And I remember there was, um, I, I had a professor who teach me um, um, machine, the uh, mechanical material. Uh, he was a study going to graduate school in, in Taiwan University, National Taiwan University, and I uh, admire him so much. And there was, uh, there was another professor uh, coming from the Purdue University, got a PhD, uh, and telling me, uh, actually give us a talk similar to this, two hours lecture on robotic. So all my dream when I was um, a young student is to become a, a robot scientist. Uh, so I actually studied a little bit robotic in, in, the, in the master program. So those are the things that I want to carry on. That's why I'm here. And thank you for your attention.